Okay, good morning, everybody. It looks like it is right at 10 o'clock central, so we'll go ahead and get started with our webinar. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our August 2024 WPS Medicare Audit Provider Webinar. And you know, I know we had one back in June, and we generally try to have these quarterly, so we're about a month early with this one. But the main reason for that is that we had some information that wasn't quite available with the June webinar, and it's pretty relevant, a few reminders that we really wanted to get out. So that's why we're having it now instead of sometime next month. But a few housekeeping items, first of all, we uh, I, I will be sending out the recording, the PowerPoints, the attendance certificate, the CET type certificate, and a, just a copy of the agenda again to any attendees within a few days of the meeting. Get a lot of value out of these surveys just internally so we know how to improve our sessions but also it's important from a cms perspective because this is really how we get graded on our outreach and if we have outreach if we tell cms we have outreach but we're not getting surveys they start to question that so just a reminder the survey is in the powerpoint it's in the email i sent and i'm going to click right now you'll find that link in the chat area now uh, that takes you to the survey. It's a pretty quick survey. We just appreciate that feedback if you take a few minutes. Uh, just a, before we get like the last couple of issues of the webinar, right before then I'm gonna have just a very quick break to let people catch up with questions they wanna type in. Also, again, to give you a chance to do the survey toward the end of the session. So just as a reminder though, these are not for MAC staff, so any auditors any from any MAC, whether it be WPS or anybody else, cannot take the surveys. They're only for providers, consultants, home office staff, all of that. That's fine for them. That's what we're looking for the feedback for. Here's a, a link to the survey again. The other thing I'll mention is we have the QR code for those of you that prefer using your smartphones to just snap a, an image of the QR code, you can take the survey that way too. So for the agenda, some of these topics are perennial and we have them in pretty much every webinar, but today we have some new ones that we're gonna bring up. So S10, again, we talk briefly about that in every webinar and we have a few things, a few frequent questions that I wanted to answer here. The big one that really led, one of the two things that led to us having this webinar now versus later is the DISH projects, the, specifically the SSI realignment project. So we're gonna talk about the wrap up of the Alina Medicare Part C Day project and the SSI realignments that we're just now starting. The low volume hospital add-on payment, I have a reminder for that about the 9-1 due date and then also just a little bit of explanation and background, especially about what's gonna be happening 1-1. SCH, MDH, Seoul Community and Medicare Dependent Hospitals. This is something we haven't really covered a whole lot in the webinars in the past, but I wanted to just bring up a few things to uh, you know, talk about the background of them, how to apply for that if it, if it affects you. Provider-based physician's costs, nothing really new to bring up, just again, kind of an educational opportunity to talk about this, some of the findings we've had. Bad debt policies and regulations, largely the same thing there, nothing really new. Uh, we have wage index reminders. We're obviously heading into the wage index season. One of the due dates is coming up very quickly for edits. In fact, it's 9-3, uh, so we'll talk about that. And then as always, we'll wrap up with an overview of our, basically our current educational resources, the website we have out there, the webinars, and then the YouTube training resources, which will have two new YouTube videos coming out by the end of this week. And the thing about questions, 
What I want to mention here is feel free to type in your questions along the way. We don't have to wait until the end for those by any means. In fact, if you have one on a topic, I kind of prefer it during that topic. So it's very relevant, very fresh in everybody's mind. So feel free to type that into the chat area. I've got that open in one of my other monitors so I can keep an eye on that. So with that, let's head into our first topic with S. as a three-year average for the upcoming rates that'll be effective 10 one I say expected because, of course, CMS has to finalize that. Well, they have to propose it and then finalize it in the Federal Register. But the other thing I do want to mention is there, for a few, few years now, there's been discussion about how from the, the data from the COVID years, the COVID PHE, public health emergency, are uh, kind of tainted data. They don't reflect the the expected utilization for hospitals in the future. So there have been concerns about that, about using those three years. So again, we don't know if CMS is gonna propose something different because keep in mind the data here is starts 10-121, which was still in the middle of the PHE. So again, some hospitals had much higher utilization of, of charity care in this case, some had much lower. It just depends on the situation. So the data is not perfect, and CMS is trying to take that into consideration. So we'll wait and see what they propose next year. The other thing about this is these audits are performed on DISH eligible hospitals. Now, for our purposes for this, that basically means DISH reporting hospitals. Any hospital that has reported DISH on E Part A Line 34. And that does currently include sole community and Medicare dependent hospitals, which Medicare dependent hospitals, there's probably never gonna be a change there, but sole community hospitals, we're gonna see a few times that there's a situation where the hospital specific rate is higher than the federal rate. Therefore, they're really not getting any benefit from additional uncompensated care. And for that reason, there's really not a whole lot of risk and no reason for us to review it. That being said, we are still currently required to audit it for those sole community hospitals. But I say currently, because again, that very well may change. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if in the coming years that changes. Uh, this is the excerpt from the Federal Register that where CMS basically said, we are still auditing them. There have been a lot of questions about why. Here's CMS's response, but again, that may change. Now that gets a little convoluted in the next uh, few discussions about some of the templates, and that's what I wanna clarify in this webinar. The other thing about this is, even if you didn't have DISH on your as submitted cost report, so if you didn't have it on your as submitted cost report, we're not going to be selecting the hospital for audit, but if you amend that cost report to add DISH in, then we will have to audit it down the road. We'll we'll take a look at the amended cost report, and even if it's after the 1231 due date, or even close to the 1231 due date, we're gonna have to start an audit at that point. So we certainly would prefer that if you do have an amended cost report for Medicaid day listings, for example, that these be submitted as soon as possible so that we can actually start the audit, hopefully in the normal cycle. But that's just what I'll mention there. The other important thing about this is that this is the last year we are dealing with the current S10 instructions. They have changed fairly, fairly substantially for uh, cost report periods beginning on or after 10 one And I know you're already filing these cost reports. You've already filed them in many cases. So you're probably already aware of some of these changes. We've talked about them in the webinars in the past, and I even have a, a YouTube video on our website about those changes, about the templates, how they differ. 
but this is the last year under the old instructions. We're going to be next year around February when we have our full S10 webinar. We're obviously going to hit that very hard so you know how we're auditing it. So now we're going to get into the exhibits, and this is where some of that confusion comes up that I want to try to clarify. So first of all, I have the excerpt from the S10 Part 2 instructions for Exhibit 3C, which is the total bad debts. Now, notice I have some, things, some pieces bolded here. If the sole community hospital is eligible to receive a dish payment, but E Part A Line 48 is greater than Line 47, do not complete this listing. Line 48 is our hospital specific payment. And if that's greater than line 47, which is the federal payment, the thought is that nothing we really do for uncompensated care within reason at least is going to impact their total payment. So there's no reason to submit a listing. Again, we still have to audit it. So eventually we're gonna need a listing barring a CMS change down the road, but you do not have to submit the listing at the time of acceptance for now. And that, that'll probably stay the same. So the only question is whether or not we'll really have to audit it next year. That's up to CMS. So I'm gonna go through a few related frequently asked questions about that. The first one is about critical access hospitals. So do they still have to fill out an S10 and those two exhibits, 3B and 3C? And the answer is yes, which is kind of unfortunate at this point, but it's very clear for, for filling out S10 at least. If you look at the worksheet S10 instructions, there's actually a very clear blurb that says section 1886D, which are acute care hospitals and cause are required to complete this worksheet. The thing about this is I, I believe this is kind of somewhat outdated information. Uh, it, so Puerto Rico hospitals, that's a different uh, situation. They, they're they still under the incentive, or at least they were under the incentive for longer than the normal, or I shouldn't say normal, other non-Puerto Rico hospitals. And But the reason CMS needed this data for critical access hospitals historically was that the EHR incentive payment was driven by S10, driven in part by S10. Now again, except for Puerto Rico hospitals, the EHR incentive program is completely over. Uh, so I suspect at some point, in fact, we're gonna propose, we, we've got a proposal we're gonna send through to CMS about various changes for the next form set they're working on. And this is one thing we're gonna remind them that, hey, this can be removed. It really is only needed for acute care hospitals now, but you have to fill it out still. That being said, the exhibits, there's no real specific reference in any of the exhibit instructions or this or anywhere saying yes or no, cause have to fill out the exhibits. They have to fill out the form. There's nothing really saying they do or don't have to fill out the exhibits. So I can't really give you 100% assurance but I can tell you that we've never expected them or required them to be completed. We've never rejected a cost report for them not being completed. And they're certainly not part of our S10 audits. So hopefully that's at least a little bit of assurance that you don't need to worry about the templates if you're a CAW. I'd like to see CMS clean that up a bit and be very clear about it. That's something else we'll propose. So now let's move back to the acute care providers and those that do not report DISH, at least on the estimated cost report. So the question again is, do they have to submit exhibits 3B and 3C? So I have the instructions from those two exhibits, and I have one section underlined under each of them. It says, again, if worksheet E part A line 48 is greater than line 47, do not complete this listing. But other than that, uh, if it's sole community hospital the other way, you know, you, you would have to. But interestingly, if you look at exhibit 3C, there's a piece that is not found in 3B. It says IPPS hospitals eligible for DISH and UCC must complete an exhibit 3C. So the inverse of that is that if you're not eligible for DISH, you're not reporting DISH, 
you don't have to complete an Exhibit 3C. Interestingly, that same verbiage is not in 3B. And here's kind of the reason. It's unfortunate. It would have been nice if it was clearer. But the main reason for that is that there's actually a regulatory instruction specifically for the charity care listing. For whatever reason, when CMS put out the Federal Register, they did not include 3C with the total bad debts. So the thought is that to, to at least add some instruction, they decided to put it into the policy manual, the cost reporting instructions. So it's at least somewhere. For charity care, it's in the regulation. For total bad debts, it's in the policy. Uh, the other thing about that, though, is the, the piece in the regulation specifies that if you don't have the charity care listing, it'll be rejectable. There is no rejection for the total bad debt. But again, we need it. So that's that's kind of the reason for the the disconnect. Here's the actual piece of the regulation. A cost report will be rejected for lack of supporting documentation if it does not include charity care listing. And again, for DISH eligible hospitals. So DISH reporting hospitals. Here's the, just the summary about that. So hopefully that helps to clarify that. Uh, basically, if you do report DISH, you need to have both a charity care listing and a total bad debt listing, assuming you have it, obviously, the, have those numbers, have those amounts, but it'll only be rejected if you don't have a charity care listing. And again, there's that sole community exception when you have a higher hospital specific payment. So now I'm moving to a completely different topic. We're still talking about templates, but it's it's now Medicaid day listing, which has nothing to do with S10. I still have it under that title, but it's a completely separate topic. The question here is whether or not the non-DISH acute care providers have to submit exhibit 3A for Medicaid days. Here, and there are a few pieces to this. There are a few steps. It's another convoluted discussion. But if you look at the excerpt from the S2 part one instructions, lines 24 and 25, where you're reporting your Medicaid days, it specifically says that a cost report will be rejected if it's submitted without listings supporting the DISH eligible days. So again, uh, this, notice that this really doesn't say whether the hospital's DISH eligible. This just simply says, hey, if you have a cost report and you have some DISH eligible days, which are Medicaid days, then you must have a listing. Now, if we take a look at the regulation, so notice that that references a regulation in the instruction, 413.24. If we go to that regulation, it defines DISH eligible hospitals as those claiming a DISH proportionate share hospital payment adjustment. And it specifically says for those hospitals, you must have a detailed listing. So again, the inverse of that is if you don't have DISH reported, you do not have to have a listing at the time of cost report submission. Notice it also has that exact same provision about the sole community hospital. So that's, an, that's a, another way out of a DISH listing is if you have a high hospital specific payment, you don't have to have the listing of Medicaid eligible days. But the piece I want to mention though, is you know these are all at acceptance. If there's no DISH claimed, you don't need a detailed listing at acceptance. And if you have that high hospital specific payment, you don't need the DISH listing at acceptance. But keep in mind, things can change by final settlement for two main reasons. Well, I guess three you could add. First of all, it's very common for the SSI ratio for your cost reporting period not to be available by the time you submit the cost report. And we will adjust it at the time of final settlement. That may cause a change in your DISH eligibility, it may bring you into DISH eligibility. Also, you have you may have a Medicaid day update. You may have an amended cost report with new Medicaid days, which obviously would now possibly render you eligible for DISH. The rarer situation is if you had a change in your SCH status or possibly even the rate if there was some sort of recalculation, 
then if you were exempted because of that sole community hospital specific rate, that may possibly change. It's not common at all, but that could change. And now all of a sudden we need a dish listing at the time of final settlement. Again, nothing required at acceptance necessarily, but we may still need it to audit dish at final settlement. So that's the point I wanted to make there. And that takes us through our S10 discussions. So we have just a listing of the resources that are available, um, our website, our YouTube videos, all of that. We'll see some of that later on as well. And now on to one of the maybe more important topics for this year, certainly one of these, are two current DISH projects. is public and the first one is the Alina Part C day reopening which again we're going to talk about more in the coming slides but I just wanted to mention that the main part of this is due September 25th so a little bit less than a month from now there's a second part with appeals remands that is actually going to extend for another six months uh, potentially another six months maybe even more than that if we get a remand late from the PRRB but for the main part of it, the non-remanded units, where we had nearly 3,000 of those units, we're, we're down to less than 10 right now. We're virtually done. Within about a week or so, we'll be done. Uh, but obviously, if you had a remand, then there might still be a delay for those. Not a big delay, but a little bit. The other one we're going to talk about is the brand new one that I had hoped would have been out by last webinar, and it just quite wasn't quite there, but it's change request 13413. It was issued July 26th. This is the SSI realignments prior to 10113. We're going to be looking at this link right here. This is a very important uh, link. You'll find the actual document that you need. And the effective date of this was 731. So basically, to give you a, a Heads up, any of the realignments we start to receive, they had to be dated after 731, and we can now move forward in processing those. I'll explain this due date within 24 months of the receipt. I'll give kind of an explanation for why that is. But let's go back and dig into each of these CRs individually. So first of all, the Alina Medicare Part C day reopenings. These related to reopenings were actually issued a little bit over a decade ago in about 2014. And and at the time, they weren't sure how it was going to go. So they required Max to issue notices of reopening to just hold that cost report open in case of, a, of a, an adverse decision by the Supreme Court. That's what these line of part CD reopenings that we're just now settling are all about, fin finalizing that reopening that was issued a decade ago. So the part C day, again, the question was whether or not these part C days actually belonged in the Medicare SSI ratio or in the Medicaid ratio. The Supreme Court, they, they didn't really issue a perfect decision, like saying one way or the other. They remanded it back to CMS and said, issue a proper final rule and we'll call it good. They issued that final rule June 9th, 2023, and it was retroactive saying basically for all time, Part C days belong in the Medicare SSI ratio. Now I know these things are being appealed and there are plenty of them, I'm sure, being appealed. So this will go probably back to the Supreme Court. I know it will. It's already there. I shouldn't even say probably it's there. So we're waiting on the decision there. And what basically what we're doing right now could very well be reversed. It might need to be changed yet again. But I just wanted to mention that we're, we're finalizing these per this CR. And 
Part C days are now in the SSI ratio all the way back to the beginning of DISH. Although I, I say this impacts discharges from 10104 to 93013, the rule does, but the CR doesn't generally go that far back because, again, most of those units were not even open. They weren't even reopenable at the time uh, a decade ago. We could only reopen the ones that were within three years. So that's what we're doing right now. The thing about this, though, most of these settlements that we're issuing are going to be zero settlements because it's the same SSI ratio that's been there all along. CMS still required us to do a zero settlement rather than a closure, again, to establish the appeal rights. The Supreme Court uh, was kind of basically part of that decision that there needed to be appeal rights. This is just a link to our WPS website, as well as a screenshot showing we have an article there about this CR. There's a YouTube video attached to it. So all of that. And again, the other piece of this is that there might there are some of these that are not normal reopenings, they're appeals remands, and those are going to be issued, they're due within 12 months, 12 months of either the remand or the get those done as soon as possible as well. Now, the thing about this is, again, there's no change. The only real adjustments that were made were for any interim payment changes we needed to make to reflect the last settlement and any adjustments that were needed for edit clearances in the software. But there's no SSI ratio adjustment. There's no memo adjustment needed. We talked with CMS about this, and the response was that the NPR letter itself establishes the appeal rights and really the Supreme Court decision kind of paired in with that is what established the appeal rights. So there's no need for a separate adjustment for that, that issue. So that takes care of the Alina. And we're, uh, again, we're wrapping that up. We're very close to that. We're switching over to the remand piece and we'll take care of those. all being sent hard copy we were compressed into a very short time frame for again nearly 3,000 units and we had to work with our mailroom to find out the best process to actually be able to do this and that means they're being sent out by mail to the by, by hard copy to the responsible contacts for those and the reason for this by the way is the paperless process there is a lot of verification and it causes delay that has to go on before we can send that out through the paperless email process. With this very compressed time frame, we just were not going to be able to do that for every single one of those units. So your normal reopenings in NPRs should still be sent out. If you signed up for the paperless email process, that will still continue. This project was just outside of that, again, due to the very compressed time frame. And uh, I will mention that for the SSI realignments, since we no longer have that compressed time frame, we are going to go back and use the paperless NPR process if you signed up for it. And now we have the next question kind of leading to this next topic. SSI realignment reopening requests for the more recent cost reporting years, are they still due three years after the NPR date? And the answer to that is it doesn't matter what year it is for the SSI realignment before 10113 or after 10113, they fall outside of the normal three year requirement. And the reason for that is that it is a it is a uh, separate regulation. The SSI realignment is a regulation outside of the reopening section. So CMS a while back issued uh, an instruction that this does not fall under the three-year reopening timeframe. And that's uh, partly what leads to this 
SSI realignment CR. And yeah, Joe, for the paperless NPR, so there, I believe there is a link on our website, and I'm, I, I might go and send this out with the email. I think there's a link on our website with the instructions for that, but I, I have to be sure about that. I'll, uh, when I send the email out at the end with all this documentation, I'll make sure to include some instructions on that. Okay. So, and we'll, uh, Lisa, we'll also talk a little bit more about that three-year issue in the coming slides, too. So, first of all, for the SSI ratios themselves, we, we want to just talk about what, how the ratio is normally calculated and how it's realigned. So, the SSI ratio definition, the, the formula or the calculation, is we take patients, the number of patients for a particular year, which we'll get to in a bit, that are entitled to both Medicare Part A and Supplemental Security Income. So they have to be entitled to both, divided by all the patients entitled to Medicare Part A, regardless of whether they have SSI. So in other words, out of your patients entitled to Medicare Part A, how many of them are also entitled to SSI? That's your SSI ratio. Well, thank you very much, Josh, for putting that website link there. And that's to the paperless NPR. So by default, the standard SSI ratio is calculated using a federal fiscal year, 10 1 through 930, regardless of the provider's reporting period. Now that federal fiscal year, uh, the way we determine which SSI ratio is going to go for your cost report, you use the fiscal year begin of your cost report and find out which federal fiscal year it falls in, and that's the SSI ratio we would grab. Now, this is a link to the CMS website. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and open that up here. I didn't do that, this in the session yesterday, but I'm gonna open that up just to show you where what it looks like. This is CMS again, and this one took you directly, it's under acute care, PPS, it's under DISH, you know, notice it gives you that formula, gives you some background. But down here are those SSI ratios. Now, they're broken out a little bit. We have the 2014 through present. These are outside of that CR. And then we have the CMS 1739F SSI ratios. These are the ones, uh, 1739 was the Part C issue. So these have already been corrected for Part C. In fact, they were updated years ago anyways. That are paid. Or I should say just entitled. Is it all of them that are entitled or is it just those that were covered and paid? And R3 basically reversed that and said covered alone is never going to be used as an SSI ratio again. It's all entitled. So total entitled Part A days. Again, that's outside of what we're talking about, but that's what R3 is all about. And I know I covered that in the last webinar as well. But the point is, these are the SSI ratios based on the federal fiscal year. Now, notice uh, the way they've labeled them, by the way, they, they so 2001-2002, that means 10-1-01 through 9-30-02. So it's federal fiscal year 02. You'd find your fiscal year beginning, or if your cost report began between 10-1-01 and 9-30-02, this is the one you'd pick. But again, I want to stress, these are your standard federal fiscal year SSI ratios. So that's what we have there. The realignment. This is that separate regulation I was getting at. 42 CFR 412-106-B3. It basically says, and by the way, this regulation came into play just a couple of years after DISH started. It actually goes back to 10-1-1987 whereas DISH technically started in May of 85 there. So, again, it's a little bit later. 
but we have, if, if the hospital prefers that CMS uses its cost reporting period instead of the federal fiscal year, it must furnish to CMS through the MAC a written request. Notice that it says the hospital's name, provider number, and it just says cost report period end date. But what we're going to see with this CR is that we also need period, and you're basically locked into that ratio after you elect realignment. But again, this is outside of the entire section for reopenings, which is why it's outside of the three-year window. So as far as what a realignment is, for illustration, I just have a, I have a long period from 10 one all the way through 12 23 and Every, for both scenarios, every month has the exact same sets of days. Realignment just means we're using a different section of that big window. For the federal fiscal year, we're using 10 1 through 930. And in this example, it gives us an 11.19 SSI ratio. When we realign for this 1 1 through 1231 cost report, we're shifting our window to use these different months. And just by the nature of utilization and volatility in healthcare, the days would be a little bit different, just again, naturally. Uh, some higher, some lower. And the result when you take these new sets of days just so happens to be a little bit higher. 12.55 is an SSI ratio. It just as easily could have been 10.2. You never really know until you look at the data. And there's no there's not necessarily any logic to why it would be higher or lower. It's just what happened those months. So that's what a realignment is all about. Which window of time are you going to use? The thing is, it could be higher or lower, but once you do request that it, it's locked in. The other thing I want to stress is that just because you have a higher SSI ratio when you realign doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have additional dish. It'll obviously never be lower dish, but it might not be higher because if you're already below, you're already and still below the 15% dish uh, patient percentage threshold, then you're not going to qualify for dish, barring an exception for certain providers. But you're not going to qualify for dish. So let's say your SSI ratio and Medicaid ratio before the realignment was 12, 12%. And then now with the new realignment, it bumped it up to 13%. You're still below 15%. You're still not going to get DISH. Uh, operating DISH, I want to stress that. Operating DISH only. If you're an urban hospital with uh, fewer than 100 beds, you can qualify for the, the capital DISH. And... Oh, I'm sorry, fewer. fewer uh, at least 100 beds, I'm sorry. So urban with at least 100 beds, you qualify for capital dish, and that's that's not subject to the same threshold. So that's the point I wanted to make there. The other thing is if you're capped, if you're already at the, let's say if you're capped by a 12% dish, which many hospitals are, if you're already above that cap, then additional SSI ratio is not gonna do anything, you're still capped at the same amount again, for operating dish only. So the point is, you'd wanna to check to see, is this even gonna impact me as a hospital before you submit that? That being said, I do wanna stress that SSI realignments, again, they're a separate, separate animal, separate regulation. They are not subject to the same materiality constraints that we have for normal reopenings. So even if it was, a, I mean, Honestly, even if it was a zero settlement, if you put one through and you didn't maybe realize that it didn't affect you, we are still, we have been required for years to still settle that with the new SSI ratio. Even if it's a zero settlement, even if it's a $500 settlement, it's not subject to the materiality. But of course, that that's, uh, you know, everybody is spending more time. You're spending more time, we're spending more time if there was no impact. So you might want to consider that. But it's important to understand just how it's going to impact you before requesting it. Now, before this CR came out, we were required to send any request on to CMS 
wait for them to recalculate the SSI ratio because only they have that data. We do not have any access to that data. And then we'd have to wait for them to return the new realigned SSI data ratio. And that starts our 180 day clock, the six month clock for us to do the reopening. Now, again, that's a little bit different under the CR and we'll explain that in just a bit. Now the breakdown is for fiscal years beginning prior to 10 13 versus those beginning 10 13 and after. The reason for this breakdown was again that Alina Medicare Part C day issue. It was all about how CMS issued the final rules in the earlier years. They they corrected it effective 10 13 and forward. Again, there there could certainly still be appeals about that, but it couldn't really be because the final rule wasn't effectuated properly because it was. So 10 13 and later, that was a pretty locked down issue with the Part C days. Those are still gonna follow the exact same SSI realignment process where you'll send us the request, we'll send it on to CMS and we have to wait for them to come back to us. We've been doing those forever, or not forever, but we've been doing those without any pause. As many of you know, the ones 10, 1, 13 and prior have been on kind of a hold waiting for this Part C day issue to be resolved, which it now is. And this CR right here is kind of that final implementation that started with all the Supreme Court decisions, the final rule, and the Alina CR, I guess you could say. And now finally, this CR is the last step where we can now finally move forward with those realignments that have been waiting out there in many cases for years. The one thing I do want to mention about that, and I'm going to show you that Alina or that SSI realignment CR in just a bit, but I do want to mention any old realignment request you had for those pre 10 1 13 years, those have to be settled or those have to be re resubmitted. And it, that can be done in kind of two ways. The CR references a a uh, verification or confirmation, basically you confirming, yes, I still want to move forward with that realignment. But, you know, you might not even, you know, if there's been a change in ownership or whatever, you might not even realize that you did submit the request because, again, it's been years ago. So we're perfectly fine if you just submit a new request. Really, they're both going to look pretty much the same. They need to have the provider number, fiscal year begin, fiscal year end, and just say, I'd like to realign. So it's kind of a question whether you say, I'd like to realign or I'd still like to do what I requested before, which was the realignment. It's just kind of a technicality, whichever way will work. But if you did, if you know you issued something prior to 731 of this year, basically don't think we can move forward with the old one. We have to wait for you to submit something new. So this is a link to our website where we have some instructions, basically a summary of the CR, and you can see it down here as well. Again, that only applies to pre 10 13 Technically, this goes all the way back to 10 1987 fiscal year begins. It doesn't go to those first couple of years because realignments were, the regulation wasn't there yet. Now, again, uh, we're talking very old cost reports, and obviously we're past three years, which again, CMS, that is, that is fine with them. The one thing I will mention though, is that the, the difference, the kind of a technical difference is if it's within three years, we still follow the normal reopening verbiage, if you will, the revised notice of program reimbursement. Again, it's not subject to a, to a uh, materiality, that's one difference, but you'll get the same type of letter as you would for any other reopening. If it's outside of a three year period, it's just a technical difference. We call it a revised settlement instead. The letter will look a little bit different, but the end result for you is the same. And let's see, we have a, we have a couple questions here. If a rehab unit was settled using an incorrect rehab SSI ratio, could this qualify for reopening to correct? So this one would be, since realignment doesn't apply, for the rehabs, 
this would be outside of that. Uh, basically, it'd be, they'd follow the same reopening requirements, and it would have to be within the three years in that case. So the realignment regulation that's separate from the reopening regulation only applies to the acute care hospitals. So that one you'd have to be within three years. And as far as the, yeah, the realigned SSI ratios, so I'm gonna show that here in just a little bit. It's actually, in fact, if you go to our website, well, in fact, let me do that right now. If you go to this link on our website, you'll see this right here. And we have a link to two different things. We have a link to the CR itself, which actually, you know what, they're, uh, yeah, one of them is a link to the CMS website, just their whole page about this. The other one's the more detailed link. If you can kind of see that, that's linking to a zip file on the CMS website. And that zip file looks like this one. Oh, that ain't it. Uh, let me find that again. Just had it up a bit ago. Oh, here it is. Looks like this one right here. So that zip file that that link takes you to, gives you, it gives you this. It gives you the CR itself. So if this document down here is the CR, and then all of these. And the point I wanna make there is you no longer have to go try to get the data yourself. CMS has clearly listed it for everybody so you can compare your realigned ratio to the standard ratio to see if there's even a chance it would benefit you. And then you'd wanna do that additional analysis to see, does that mean additional dish? So hopefully that helps to clarify that. Again, all of that can be found on our website. And well, so you, that's a good question. Uh, you wouldn't actually need to request it from, you wouldn't need to request the cost report. All you really need to do is go to that other CMS website that I had and look and see what ratio was there, that, what ratio, what the standard ratio is. So you don't necessarily need to find it from the cost report itself. If that makes sense there. So that would be your best bet if you're trying. is a very good point if the if the cost report was settled using the correct SSI ratio uh, which one other thing to think about when we're talking about really old years remember there was the the whole base state issue that that was a matching concern that may have resulted in a different it did it resulted in different SSI ratios for some of those older years so there could be a difference for that itself so that's something to, to keep in mind there but now you know at least what it's what is uh what the two ratios are that we can compare against. So now let's see, do I have everything here? Yeah, the requests themselves. Once you've decided you'd like to make a realignment request, go ahead and submit those to audit.advisement at wpsic.com. Again, just remember it, it has to contain the provider number. match the two dates that they have on their realignment log because if they don't that means they pulled the wrong data or th that means they could have pulled the wrong data to calculate that ratio to begin with which obviously means they're going to need to pull different data if the year you sent us is proper but it doesn't match the year on their listing we have to send that on to them so they can recalculate the SSI ratio another question that has come up quite a bit is whether or not these can be submitted in a uh, bulk submission. So multiple providers or multiple periods at once. And the answer is yes. If you have uh, multiple years, certainly send those on. Just make sure it's very clear in that uh, email. You know, again, everyone has all three of these pieces of information. 
That's all we need there. And again, we do prefer email so we can track it much more quickly. My goal is to send out a confirmation email within a few days so you know we've received it and we've logged it. Now, obviously, we are we're already starting to get quite a few of these in, so it's it's definitely a lot. We want to keep track of it. But if you if you haven't heard, let's say if you haven't heard back within a week for confirmation, uh, feel free to either send another email here, or you can send it to my own individual email, Chris dot Severson at WPSIC.com. But basically give us a week The we have a few people working on this or a couple people that'll be kind of handling this, the, the coordination of this. So that's what we have there. Oh, the other thing about this, uh, these are very old units, uh, again, all the way back to 1988, 1987, depending on the fiscal year. And a lot of these were well before we had any sort of electronic filing system in place. Uh, these are going to be on very old cost support form sets. So the big part of our challenge is to find the file. Find it first of all, because keep in mind, some of these wouldn't be an electronic system. They'd be in boxes somewhere. Some of them, we've had multiple Mac and FI transitions over the past couple of decades. So we might need to find them from other Macs if they didn't already get transitioned. So the point is that explains, that is a major explanation for why the due date is 24 months from the date of the receipt. One individual SSI realignment request, if we had everything we needed, we had the cost report, it's a relatively new one, nothing major has changed with it. One of them doesn't take all that long to do. If it's not, in, it's not immediate, it's not press a button and it's done, but it doesn't take all that long to do. But when we have a huge, huge workload coming in all at once, and especially when a large percentage of them are gonna be very difficult to find, to reconcile, to make sure we have the right settlement, the right file, and to clear all the edits for. Because keep in mind, when the so when CMS software updates, when they make those changes, a lot of times they make changes retroactively, which means if we take an old cost report and we open it up again in the new software and recalculate it, there's a possibility the settlement might change depending on what changes CMS has made there's a great possibility there might be new edits that need to be corrected. So there's a heck of a lot of work even getting to the point where we can start the SSI actual work, the, the analysis and the, the adjustments. That is why we have this 24 months from the date. We're certainly not gonna be sitting on, any, on anything waiting for that date. Those that come in where we have the files all ready to go, and there are no major issues. Those babies are gonna be going through as quickly as we can, but those where we just can't find the files, we have to search for them. We have kind of a multi-step search process. Those are the ones that are gonna take a while. So the point about that, if you happen to have the old cost report, whether it be an MCR file, or whether even if it's a PDF, that's still better than nothing, if you want to submit that, you're not required to by any means, but if you want to include that, then that may very well expedite the review of that unit. Just naturally, because it's an easier unit to do, we have everything we need. So that's the one piece of information I'll mention. You know, even if you don't include it, again, you're not required to include it in the submission, but if we're going through a multi-step process to find them, one of our steps might be reaching out to you to see, hey, do you happen to have this? So again, if you don't, you don't, but that just uh, be aware of that might be a step we take just to see if you do. Now, as far as the status, because again, we have so much going on at once, we really won't have a status available for any unit until the adjustment goes out to you for review. We're gonna give you the normal two week adjustment period even though reopenings aren't normally bound to that, we're gonna give that just to make sure everything's good, no rework needed. And at that point, you'll know the status. And obviously if we reach out to you to ask about the file, you'll know kind of the status of what's going on there. But the point is we can't give you any sort of estimated time frame. If somebody sends in their request right now and says, can I get an estimate on when it's gonna be done? The only answer we can give is 24 months hopefully sooner, but we can't really give any better estimate. 
because it's it's not a FIFO type situation necessarily, first in first out. Uh, because again, some of these are going to be easy to do. Some are going to take a lot more effort to find the file. So, just some information there. And let's see. Deb has a question about how far back is Hickris data available? You know, that's a that's a good question, and I I know CMS has it available uh, far back. And because I know we've even had to ask for some stuff from 1982 for some SCH MDH requests. So they have it available, but the biggest problem is it's absolutely not, for those old, old years, it's not user friendly at all. And it takes, it really takes an ex, ex, eh, expert to be able to understand that old system and really even get data out of it. It's, it's a very old way of putting that data. computer file storage way back in the day. So I don't really have a good answer for how far back it is available. Um, we know we have some stuff CMS has given us on that one. Okay, so now I wanted to move on to the next topic, which is really largely a reminder, first of all, for the low volume payment. It's uh, somewhat of a rare payment, uh, approximately 600 providers currently qualify for this payment. But the old provisions, if you take a look at 412-101B, these were in effect prior to fiscal year 2011. And depending on what Congress does, they could technically become effective again January 1st, 2025. The old provisions for this payment were that you had to be more than 25 road miles for the nearest hospital and you had to have fewer than 200 total discharges. Yeah, I think a two year time frame initially when they expanded it, it's been rolled forward ever since then. Sometimes, Cong well, a few times Congress has acted late and it had to it expired and then had to retroactively be reinstated. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if that's what happens again January 1st. You know, it's an election year, a lot of things are going on. Uh, it might very well expire and then we might see something from Congress after that. And the key thing I want to point out with anything coming out of Congress, any legislation, is that we cannot, Max cannot just immediately act on legislation. It has to go, first of all, through a public rule, public uh, public comment period in the Federal Register to become regulation, and then it has to be implemented by CMS policy. We have to take our instruction from CMS. We can't take it directly from Congress and legislation. So for that reason, let's say 12, 12 31, just throw that date out at the end of the year. Let's say Congress passes legislation that extends this. That doesn't really do anything. You're still going to be terminated from low volume January 1st. And just to give you an estimate, you probably won't see it come back into play until about March, I would say. Now, again, it'll like if it happens, it'll likely be retroactive, which means we would have to reprocess claims. And CMS may require another mileage attestation. But all of that is speculation. I'm just telling you what's happened in the past when this same situation has occurred. So the new expanded provisions, you only have to be 15 road miles for the nearest hospital, and you have to have less than 3,800 total inpatient discharges. Now that, since it's total, it's not Medicare, it comes from the cost report at S-3, line one, column 15. Now, the important thing here is that the cost report we have to use is the most recent one that was submitted to us as of the date you make the attestation or that you request low volume. It's not something that ever gets updated to a newer period. Your, your factor is locked in at that time. The other thing 
that CMS has clarified, and it's really odd, but they've never changed it, is that the length of the cost reporting period does not matter. If you happen to have a short cost reporting period or a long cost reporting period that was the latest one submitted as of that date, that's the one we are required to use. Uh, again, we received clarification from CMS on that. I, I kind of hope they change that at some point. It seems more logical to require a 12 month cost reporting period, but that's not the way it currently is. Just a quick side note, you know, we're using total discharges right now, but at the beginning of this expansion from 2011 through 2018, it was actually Medicare discharges used and it was only 1800. So they changed it to use total. And because of that, we need to use the cost report. There's no other data that we have that would show total discharges. Now, the other thing I guess that gets asked is, even if for some reason total discharges changed on that cost report, that still would not change your factor. We were locking it in at that point and it will not get reconciled barring a mistake. If a mistake was made, then of course it would be changed. But a mistake as in we pulled the wrong period or we pulled the wrong number. But if the right cost report period was used, it's locked in. This is an example of the calculation. And here's a screenshot from the Federal Register that kind of summarizes this. But essentially what this means is if you have anywhere, if you have less than 500 discharges, you're going to get a 25% uh, payment adjustment. Fewer than 500 discharges, you get the full thing. If you have anywhere from 500 to 3,800, you have to follow this formula. Certainly the fewer discharges you have, the higher your formula is going to be or the higher your factor is going to be up to 25%. Once you start getting close to 3,800 discharges, your factor is going to get closer and closer to zero. So that's the point we want to make there. And then again, if, if Congress doesn't change this, then we're back to a 200 total discharge requirement and it's just a flat 25%. Here's just an example, 1,250 discharges get you a 19.32%, and that is an add-on to all of your inpatient payments, all of your inpatient uh, federal payments there. So now onto the requirement, what do you need to do? The due date for these mileage attestations, CMS requires an attestation that your mileage is still within that qualification, and basically that means no new roads have opened up, no new hospitals have opened up that would cause your mileage to change. They require that attestation, or if you've never qualified before, you have to show the mileage, you have to provide all the documentation. And it's due by September 1st, which this year is a Sunday. Now, uh, the one thing I wanna mention is, well, I've been following up with any provider that qualified in a prior year that has not yet submitted it. For the past week and a half, I've been following up and that we're down to just a couple dozen providers that I'm waiting to hear back from. So I'm gonna continue to follow up throughout the week. But again, if you know for sure that you have not submitted this and you think you qualify, please make sure to submit that by 9-1. Because if you don't, the status becomes effective 30 days after we complete the review, after of course we receive it. So that obviously puts a delay in your in your uh, payment, basically. And it wouldn't be retroactive. You lose at least a month of payments that way. So 9-1 is definitely an important date for you. Now, the interesting thing about that is that this is finalized in the Federal Register. And I put a link here because, in fact, the Federal Register was is published officially today. 828 is when the final rule officially went out. Now, the, the link here is to the public inspection website, which has been out for a while. They always post it that way first, about a month or so before the final rule. So you could have found it there. And obviously it's the same as it's been for a number of years. We also have an article on our website just about low volume in general. And here is CMS change request 13734 that was issued, what, about a week ago that uh, also incorporated this requirement. 
But the point is, it's the same process as last year. Again, send in your requests to either of my two email addresses here. And again, I'll confirm it, I'll respond. And usually the way we do it is we send the letters out in bulk. So we wait till we get everything in, we reconcile everything, we do the review in bulk, and then we send the letters out in bulk. And for that reason, they usually go out between September 15th and September 20th, still well in advance of the 10-1 effective date. And that'll tell you your factor. Again, as far as pass or fail, it's pretty pretty easy criterion to meet. There's nothing really that we should be able to surprise you with. So as long as you know you met the mileage requirement, and as long as your discharges were less than 3,800, you're going to qualify for the low volume. Uh, of course, as long as you submitted it by 9-1. And I already talked about the potential retroactivity of the, if, if Congress doesn't act very soon. So that takes us through low volume. Now I wanted to move into sole community and Medicare dependent hospitals. And, you know, I'm not going to spend a great amount of time on these. It's more educational. It's not anything new by any means. But I do have a link to our WPS website that goes through these in detail. And we have, for SCHs, we have the regulation and the policy. The one thing I want to point out is neither the regulation or the policy provide a specific time frame for MAC review or for CMS review. But fortunately, CMS changed it a while back to say that when it, regardless of whenever this finally gets reviewed, it's going to be retroactive back to the date of your request. It used to be a 30, day for, 30 days from the approval date. So obviously with the long review process, that could hurt a provider. Now it's retroactively effective to the date you make the request in the first place. Now there are a few options. Again, this is just purely educational. It's been around for decades, but I'm going to run through the options for how a provider would qualify for SCH. The, the easiest one to review, but it's also now the rarest, is if you're greater than 35 road miles from the nearest like hospital, it doesn't matter if you're urban or rural, you qualify for sole community hospital status. The reason I say it's the rarest is that generally any hospital that could have qualified for this has already qualified for it long ago. Barring any closure of a hospital, that's about the only thing that could change this. Or I guess possibly closure of roads too. But that's the easy one. The next one requires a few different things. First of all, you have to be rural for anything else. If you're less than 35 road miles, you can only qualify if you're rural or rural reclass. So if you're located 25 to 35 miles, then one of the ways you can do it, the most common way, is that you have to prove that you serve 75% of the total residents, to, I stress total residents, or Medicare beneficiaries, whichever one you wanna go with. So you serve 75% of them of those that were admitted to other like hospitals in your 35 mile radius. Uh, right, and it's not really, I shouldn't say admitted to other like hospitals, admitted to hospitals in your 35 mile radius, including yourself, obviously. Or if your service area is larger, we'll take that, that uh, number of zip codes instead. So that's quite a bit of documentation that goes into that. You have to prove the, what your service area is, you have to draw out a 35 mile radius and you have to get data generally from CMS or a few different other places proving who went to the hospital and where they were admitted and prove that you were 75% of it. Now again, that's a very quick explanation of something that's fairly complex. For those that need this, it's actually in our uh, website. We have a YouTube video that goes through it that website I just showed a bit ago. The next option is if you failed this first option, but you would have met it, well, first of all, you have to have fewer than 50 beds, but you would have met that option one, except that you're such a small hospital that you didn't have some specialty services that the patients needed, so they had to go elsewhere. If that's the only reason you failed option one, then you can qualify through that. 
or if you're located in a very uh, kind of remote area where topography and or prolonged weather conditions render other hospitals inaccessible for at least 30 days in, in two out of the three years, then you're considered a sole community hospital. Now, if you're 15 to 25 miles to the nearest hospital, in other words, you're fairly close to them, then the only thing that you can qualify under is that topography and prolonged weather condition criterion. But there is another one that has nothing to do with mileage. You have to be rural, and regardless of the mileage, if you can prove that the travel time to the nearest like hospital is at least 45 minutes, again, due to roads, weather conditions, things like that, if you can prove that, then you can qualify for SCH there as well. And now what we have here for MDH, Medicare Dependent Hospital, we have a link for that one. The regulation is 42 CFR 412-108. And here we have the time frame. So the MAC must review this within 90 days of the final information receipt. We send it to CMS just for their input, but we make the final determination. It's They just want to take a look at it. They're not making a determination themselves. And this one's effective 30 days after the written notification because it's tied to a time frame. One of the important things here that we'll see in the criteria is an ongoing review of the 60% test. So the criteria themselves are, first of all, that you must be rural, must have 100 or fewer beds. And interestingly, you can't already be an SCH, which kind of makes no sense. If you are an SCH, you don't want to be an MDH anyways. SCH is more favorable payment-wise. The 60% test is the big one. You can choose to pass this test with Medicare days or Medicare discharges, but at least 60% of your total days or total discharges have to be Medicare. That's the where Medicare dependent comes from. You can either meet this in your 1987-88 base year, or we have to continuously review the last two of the last two, at least two of the last three most recently audited cost reporting periods. And again, every time a new cost reporting period is settled, then obviously that period rolls forward. We have to review those three periods. Otherwise, you'll you'll lose that status. Uh, within 30 days of that date. But obviously to qualify for the first time, we need to look at these as well, the last three years. Now the payment provision, I said sole communities were more beneficial because you get the higher of the two rates, the higher the hospital specific rate or the federal rate, and MDHs only get the federal rate plus just 75% of the difference. Whereas technically the SCH gets the federal rate plus 100% of the difference between the two rates if it's positive, MDH is only get 75%. Now this is a screenshot from E part A, the cost report. And this actually goes back to those templates we were talking about a bit ago, where I said the federal rate versus the hospital specific. Line 47 is your federal payment. Line 48 is your hospital specific payment. And if 48 is higher, you get that higher amount if you're an SCH. So that's what rolls down to line 49. You don't get harmed if it's lower. You'll always at least get federal rate at a minimum. But if it's higher, you'll get extra money there. Now, just quickly, I think this might answer your question, Nancy. Uh, for the hospital specific rate, what we have here is there are some base rates, 1982, 87, 96. Uh, the first two were for SCH and MDH. The 96 was only for SCHs. 2002 was only for MDHs. 2006 just for SCH. The I'm, I'm kind of surprised CMS hasn't come out with a rebase since then. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if we see that in the next couple of years. But the point is, we, you, we recalculate a rate, and if the newer rate is higher, that becomes locked in as your new base rate on the FIS system, the, where the claims get processed, where the rates go. 
Now, what happens is even though, let's say you're an SCH that was using the 2006 rate, we don't just put the 2006 rate out there and it just doesn't stay there forever. Instead, generally every six years approximately, whatever rate was locked in, that gets reinflated to the current year. All the market basket update factors get applied so that now FIS has a newer, fresher rate. But let me let me explain what FIS does though. So FIS knows what rate should be locked in. So for example, if it was the 2006 rate locked in, if we were back in like 2010 for claims, it would have known that, hey, there's a 2006 rate here, so I need to apply factors to get it to 2007, eight, nine, and 10. FIS does that behind the scenes. We do not update the pricer, we, we can't. It'll, it'll be erroneous if we were to update pricer or update FIS with the new rates every if we inflate it every single year that is in error pricer is built to expect rate changes at certain times and it'll take it the rest of the way up until that the date of that claim so i believe that is that explains nancy what your question is about the rate you see in cms pricer is the last time we updated fis for that which was the last time that uh it was, and I forget exactly right now what it was. We're in 2024, so it might have been. I think it was actually like four four years ago or so, four or five years ago, was the last rate that was updated to FIS, and then behind the scenes, it's taking that rate the rest of the way, and we'll we'll very likely have to reinflate that again in another year or two because again, six years tends to be the max they do that for, just for programming purposes. So that's the reason that your hospital specific rate doesn't match that they're different time periods you have to take the update factors to find out what you're actually going to be paid our hospital specific pay, payment calculation uh, does that it takes whatever the rate was in FIS and it knows what update factors it needs to apply to get to the current period so hopefully that helps to clarify that piece it's just the way it's built you know, they might redesign it down the road, but right now that's the way that system was built. So the rate gets inflated to the current year that the claim is related to, and it's then multiplied by the DRG weight from the PSNR. And basically the DRG weight is a combination of all your claims for that period uh, based on the weight. It's, it's weight adjusted. Case mix index adjusted is what the phrase is. But I do want to stress, if you look at the PSNR, you'll also see something called the weight fraction, which is transfer adjusted. If you add any transfer claims that don't get paid the full amount, uh, the weight fraction takes that into consideration. We cannot use that for our calculation. It's got to be the DRG weight. And the reason is that the original base rates, when they were all the way back to 82 and 87, that transfer adjusted data did not exist. We didn't have that. So the rates have never been transfer adjusted. Therefore, what we multiply it by cannot be transfer adjusted either. So that is, we received clarification from CMS about that years ago, and that's how it's calculated. So moving on to the next topic here, we have provider-based physicians cost. Again, nothing new. Just education here is a link to our website for provider-based physicians and we have two things out there right now we're, we're likely to add another website uh, article with some more additional information but you can go out here you can find some YouTube videos on it the provider-based physician and now I know many of you are from hospitals so if you have these you're well aware of what they are but I'll just give an overview for anybody who may for whatever reason not a provider-based physician is one that works in the hospital and they, they don't just provide services to individual patients, they also, they also provide services to the hospital at a general level. Things that don't relate to individual patient care, they might be involved with supervision of something, be on a quality control panel, just a variety of different things. So the concern here is that anything related to individual patient care 
is supposed to be billed through fee schedule, part B, and it should not show up on the cost report, that the cost should be carved out before it gets to the cost report, or before the cost report ends, I should say. So the impact, or the, the concern here, we have worksheet A82, and we're gonna see that in the next slide, we're gonna see an image of it, but the main concern is proper splitting of the provider component, which is the hospital piece, versus the professional or fish, physician component, which is, again, the fee schedule stuff. We want to make sure that split, whether or not you receive reimbursement for it, again, a CAW, critical access hospital, receives cost reimbursement, but an acute care hospital does not, for the most part. For the CAW, obviously, this matters quite a bit because it'll drive your actual reimbursement. For an acute, it's just data uh, impact, data information. So the point is, we're regardless of the reimbursement impact, we're concerned with the split. We want the data to be accurate. But there's also a secondary concern just for the acute care hospitals, not the critical access hospitals, and that's the RCE limit. And basically, that's a limit for certain types of specialties. It's, it's a cap on how much reimbursement is reasonable. Reasonable cost equivalency is what that stands for. But that does not apply to cause. I want to stress that. Now, this, I know this is difficult to see. It's a wide worksheet, but I wanted to capture it all at once. So most of this A82 is actually related to that RCE limit. From column 6 all the way to column 17, that's all RCE that does not apply to the CAW. The main part that applies well, in general, but especially to the CAW, is, you know, you're going to report every line, the different physicians you have and what cost centers their salaries were reported on, what was their specialty. Column three is the total remuneration, in other words, the amount paid to that physician by the hospital. And then columns four and five are where you split that out to identify how much of that money that you paid was related to their individual patient care which by the way, and that's professional component, the reason a hospital would pay the physician for individual patient care services is that the physician in that case would have reassigned billing rights for those services, fee schedule billing rights to the hospital. Sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the physician bills on their own for their fee schedule services. But assuming they reassign the rights, then some of that cost needs to be related to the professional component, which is then carved out. The rest of it, the related to the normal hospital type services, are the provider component. And again, for a CAW, it's as simple as that. For the acute and the other non-CAWs, you have to subject them to the RCE limits, which is a pretty intensive calculation here. Uh, only the provider component is subject to that, of course. And in the end, column 18, you identify what the adjustment is. And again, I know I'm going through that pretty quick. This is just intended to be a pretty quick overview. We have a YouTube video that goes through more detail on that. But the point that's important here is that you, you can't just report it. We need the documentation for it. So there needs to be an allocation agreement that was agreed upon between the physician and the department head, for example saying that yes, the amount of money I received is split this way, about, you know, whatever, 40% professional, 60% physician or uh, provider, whatever the split is, they need to agree to it. This is worksheet S-2, part two, exhibit one, and it is very clearly required by CMS. no need to allocate anything because they're all one way or the other. They're either all professional or all provider. Professional makes sense because, hey, there's no reason to split it or document it if it's going to be professional and carved out anyways. But if it's a 100% provider component, 
you must document that the physician has indeed not reassigned billing rights to the hospital, and that's why there's no, no uh, professional component. The key thing about this is it must be contemporaneously signed and dated by the physician or the director of department. We cannot allow anything above that. CMS has been very, very clear on this in the past that it can't be just an executive in the hospital, a CEO, CFO, president, it can't be that. It must be either the physician or the director of that department the physician works at. And the other thing is it has to be signed contemporaneously, basically very, very shortly after the end of the cost reporting period at the latest. Furthermore, there has to be documentation like time studies to support that allocation agreement. And here is a list, here's an excerpt, basically saying for physicians, the time study requirement is fairly lenient. It can be about two weeks per quarter. You don't have to follow the much more in-depth requirements that apply to everything else, like organ acquisition and others. Just as a heads up, we're gonna talk about the YouTube videos that are coming out. And one of them is gonna be organ acquisition time studies, where we'll talk about these more detailed requirements that fall for non-physicians. You can follow these as a physician if you want, but you aren't required to follow those, those uh, stringent standards. On site, the physician is on site. They're waiting for their services to be needed. They might be in a, what's called a call room. It's often called a call room, and literally, they might be there. You know, if they're done with everything else, they might be there sleeping, waiting for them to be needed. It, again, it might be 24-hour availability, so obviously they have to sleep some time. But they're available. That's the point. Uh, we have the regulations and the policy that apply to that. Availability is for acute or call. Uh, but this only is applicable to physicians. By the regulation, there are no mid-level practitioners like nurse practitioners, anything else that qualifies. The other contentious piece that's been appealed quite a bit is that there's a requirement that the provider explored available alternatives. In other words, that rather than just paying availability, that should kind of be a last resort. Was there another way to provide coverage without going this route, and you need to show that you tried and it didn't work, now you're doing availability instead. On-call, on the other hand, is off-site, but still reasonably close. There's a different policy manual that drives that. Currently, it's only for critical access hospitals. And when I say reasonably close, you have to be, the physician has to be able to arrive within 30 minutes. This one does allow for mid-level practitioners. Uh, this part I left in from the last slide, this is wrong, this last piece, it's physicians and mid-level practitioners. Now there is, uh, there has been discussion from CMS about possibly merging these two uh, sets of standards together for consistency, but they currently haven't done it. So we're kind of left with two sets of standards. And let's see, I have a question here. Nancy, do I know if there's a contact related to the CMS? Jeremy, for the call, so for the, when I was talking about the, the restrictions for the critical access provider-based physician review, that does not include TEFRA providers. They are still subject to all those other things like RC limits and uh, all that other stuff. It's just the critical access hospital explicitly that was exempt from the RC limit. So good question there. Now we'll move on to another topic, which again, this it, it's not all that new. It's a few years old for some of the changes, but there are still a lot of questions that come out of it. So I wanted to go through this. 
uh, various bad debt issues. This link takes you to our website that has a lot of different bad debt topics. In fact, I think, well, yeah, if you go to that website, you'll see all the different topics we have. But we're going to talk about a handful of them. There are YouTube videos for many of those as well. Specifically says the provider, provider may have established before discharge, which by the way, that can only mean before the current discharge. There's nothing else logically that makes sense. Before the current discharge or within a reasonable time before the current admission. Now what that means is that you might have made an indigent determination for this patient a month or so ago because they were in the hospital a month or so ago. And it's reasonable to believe that if that's not too old of a determination, you can piggyback off of that and still use that again instead of redoing an indigence determination so quickly. So that's the reason for that second piece. But the piece at issue here is before discharge. You, you must have established by that time frame that the beneficiary is either indigent or medically indigent. So if you just read this black and white, it would seem to imply, or not even imply, explicitly state that to be a valid determination, this has to be done before the discharge. Now, in reality, we know that it takes a while. There's paperwork to go through for the indigent determination. And CMS, there's been a grace period for, for years and years, a slight grace period where that indigent determination might be a little bit later, a little bit after the discharge. But the point is, it has to be reasonable. The grace period has to be reasonable. And the reasonable time frame we're using, again, we could take this and we could say, well, no, it's after discharge, it's disallowed, period. But there is that little bit of grace period. But if you don't make the indigent determination, at least by the time you were supposed to start billing under normal collection effort, then that's not going to be allowed. The indigent determination, you, you must start timely billing at that point. That's the point we're trying to make here. Now, remember the timely billing itself was fairly recently expanded quite leniently in the Federal Register. It's now 180 days after the later of the, the uh, Medicare RA or the secondary RA, any of those, which that can expand it quite a bit. So the point is, if you haven't determined it just by then, there's a concern. And that's, at that point, if you haven't billed timely, the bad debt may just not be allowable. So you essentially you have to do one of these two things by the time the timely billing requirement kicks in. That's the point we're trying to make. The other thing that comes up still is incomplete indigent determinations. Now, there are two different periods of time. Prior to 10-120, the policy required a review of assets, liabilities, income, and expenses, all four. Now notice that's policy. The regulation when all these bad debt rules were codified, effective 10-120, they did change the end of this determination requirement a little bit, but they made it more lenient. They took out the uh, expenses and liabilities and they only required assets and revenues. Since they changed it, they had to make that effective prospectively. So basically the policy is in place prior to 10 with all four required. The regulation is effect 10 and after with just those two. But if you'll notice the two that are left, those are the ones that are more contentious anyways, specifically the, uh, the assets. Revenues are pretty easy to come by. The asset verification is the more difficult one that people have appealed quite a bit. But as of this point, assets and revenues are, are, again, they're still required. Now it's the level of authority. Now, just as a side note, uh, you know, we have policy versus regulation. Some of you may be aware of the a pretty recent Supreme Court decision that basically overturned something referred to as the Chevron defense or Chevron deference. And that, when that was in place, 
there was a very important distinction between policy and regulation as, a far, as far as what the courts had to follow. That's now kind of gone. Uh, they're not forced to follow regulation anymore. So basically policy versus regulation, there's not nearly as much of a distinction anymore. But again, I just wanted to separate the two right here. That's just kind of a side note. Presumptive indigence on the same topic of indigence Again, it boils down to a provider must do their own review of these items, whether it be the four or the two, rather than relying on some third party determination. For example, you can't say that, hey, based on their credit score, we think they qualify for indigence. You can't say that based on some third party tool, they qualify for indigence. You must show that you've reviewed those items. So presumptive indigence is not allowed for Medicare bad debts, but it is allowable for S10 charity care, assuming it's in your policy itself. A couple of other issues that come up, deceased beneficiaries it, no, and bankrupt beneficiaries. These are separate from your normal collection effort because with a deceased beneficiary, the estate, if they have an estate, that's what's liable for their final costs and final bills. So the collection effort wouldn't necessarily just be sending out collection letters. If you know it's a deceased beneficiary, the collection effort is reviewing for an estate. Like any other creditor would, they, they try to establish a claim against the estate to collect those final costs. So we need to make sure that the estate review is contemporaneous and it could be documented by communications with the county, uh, maybe viewing a website if the county has one. But the point is it has to be contemporaneous because if you're too late, there's, there's no way you're going to get a claim. The estate might be closed at that point. So reasonable collection effort would say try all of your recourses as soon as possible. For bankrupt beneficiaries, your recourse is against the bankruptcy court or in the bankruptcy court to see if you can file a claim and hopefully get, get in line with the creditors to receive money. But the point is these have to be contemporaneous. These have both been issues that have come up in CMS findings against Max. So we have to follow through and require that reasonable collection effort. Another one that comes up is the proper reporting period for write-off. Here's a link to that article. 42 CFR 41389F talks about how the bad debts are to be recorded, charged off as bad debts in the accounting period in which the accounts are deemed to be worthless. Now, by the way, that's a regulation. There is a section 2176.2, and it, that's the exception for terminated provider numbers. So if you have a provider that's either completely terminated or they changed ownership and the new provider did not accept their old provider agreement and number, then regardless of when this, uh, when the collection effort stopped, when the account was deemed worthless, you can roll it back into your final year because that's the only year that exists. So that's the one exception. Now, as far as a uh, proper reporting period for write-off, this is an example from the template that's on our website, and it's also the CMS template that's used. There are a lot of dates in the newer template because it's showing essentially that it cannot be written off until all these other things have happened. First of all, you have to have a Medicaid remittance advice if it's a Medicaid patient. You have to have written it off internally on your accounts receivable. If you send it to a collection agency, it must be returned. And all collection efforts, internal or external, must have ceased by the time you write it off for your for Medicare. So basically, this last column is the later of all of these dates. And that's the year it can finally fall into for your Medicare cost report. And it can't fall into any other year. That's the thing about it. Whenever that date exists, it must be reported in that year. So this little instruction explains what this last column is. One of the questions related to that is that we have, uh, we call them sometimes resurrected accounts or even Frankenstein accounts, that term has been used, that, and these are not allowable. 
if you've already written it off in accounts receivable in an earlier year, but maybe for whatever reason forgot to write it off for Medicare, it cannot be restored and rewritten off to Medicare in your accounts receivable just to reset that date to gain Medicare reporting eligibility. That's not allowable. It would violate that regulation and that policy. It must be reported in the period it was deemed worthless. If you truly deemed it worthless seven years ago and nothing has happened since, then no collection effort. And then maybe you're cleansing your lists and you found some bad debts that were missed. You can't rewrite it off to get it in this cost reporting period. If it was within three years of your last NPR, you might be able to reopen that older cost report. But if it was prior to that, then it's it's a tainted bad debt permanently. So that's the one thing I wanted to mention here. This has come up in both Charity Care S10 reviews as well as bad debt reviews. And uh, Tom, so you, you, Section 312 says that once indigency is determined that the debt is deemed uncollectible without applying 310, you're correct, but remember what we said about 312, uh, the end of this determination has to be timely as well. So basically the bad debt would be disallowed for one of two reasons. It's the untimely end of this determination period, or you didn't, uh, you didn't start the collection effort. So basically if, if you're that late to begin with, then Essentially, what it means is you're no longer going to be able to allow that bad debt as an indigence bad debt period because your indigence determination was late. So therefore, it falls now under the normal collection effort. We can't use it as an indigent bad debt because it was a late indigence determination. So now we have to follow regular collection effort, the bills to the patient, timely billing, all of that. That's maybe another way of explaining it. So if you want protection under that section 312, the indigence determination must be done timely. So hopefully that helps clarify that further. So now what I wanted to do here is just a, like a real quick three minute break. First of all, to catch up on any questions that anybody might have, feel free to type those in. But also I wanted to post the survey link yet again to hopefully give you just a couple minutes before we move on to the next topics. Uh, I know some people have either uh, lunch or meetings right after this. So hopefully this will give you a little bit of a chance to fill that out. Again, that feedback is extremely valuable to us and CMS relies on that. So I'm gonna just break until 1145, just three minutes from now, and then we'll come back and talk about our remaining topics. Okay, so now we'll go ahead and move forward with the uh, remainder, remaining topics there. So thanks for anybody who was able to take that survey. And a question came up uh, over the break there, and I, I did misspeak earlier when I was talking about the end of this determination. It's 120 days, not 180. Uh, I've got the reopening 180-day time frame in my head, locked away in my head, so uh, it's 120 days. So let's move on to wage index. And again, these are just reminders. The 9-3 is the upcoming due date here. And that's the date that hospitals are required. Manager that are in charge of that real or that uh, wage index process. So feel free to send it to any of those. And we have 10 weeks to complete the reviews, and that 10 weeks goes very quickly. Quite a bit of work involved with that for the staff that deal with that. And the final due date is 11 15 for us to complete all of our desk reviews for the wage index reviews and submit it to CMS. Now, uh, the thing about that though, even though mid-November is our date to submit that. There are various edits that CMS is gonna go through and they may come back to us for questions and therefore we'll have to reach out to you for explanations on why there's a significant variance or something they don't expect, something that looks out of the ordinary. 
So there's that process. And then January 31st is when they release the kind of the proposed or the draft public use files. And that way you can take a look at those to see if you think something is out of whack. And then you have until February 15th to submit requests for any corrections where if you think an error was made, not a correction in the documentation, it's too late for that, but a, a correction in the, like an error. We hickered the wrong thing. We didn't make the adjustment, whatever. Uh, we need to receive the request by that date. And then we have until March 18th to transmit the hopefully absolute final revised wage index data. And we do have to notify the provider, any provider that submitted those adjustments, we have to notify you with the final determination of those. And then the last piece is, you know, after this 318 date, after you get our notification, you then have until April 1st to appeal that final determination. This little blurb talks about how to submit that appeal. It's outside of The other thing is for wage index. Now, up until recently, for several years, HFS has been the only hospital cost support software. I know there's a newer version that some, some providers use, but if you do use HFS, we strongly encourage that you submit the HFS auditor file, it's dot auditor, with any of your wage index revisions you want to make. The assumption is that you've probably already done that on your side to see the effect of it. So if you already have the file, it would certainly make it easier for you to send that on. That way you're very clearly communicating exactly what you want to change, as opposed to some email or some Word document that's a little less clear about what you're trying to change. Now, if you don't use HFS, then obviously uh, you can just submit us whatever, an Excel template or Word document, something that explains what you're trying to change. The other thing about that is we have a the contract labor spreadsheet, and we'll see the website in the next slide. This is also due, if you have this, it's a 9-3 deadline actually this year, so it's due by that time, because 9-1 Sunday, 9-2 is Labor Day. And uh, again, you might certainly receive requests for additional data as we do the review. But this is a link to the CMS, or I'm sorry, the WPS website where we have all of these wage index resources from our experts that handle this. Now we're moving on. Uh, first of all, a question. Yeah, uh, yes, the slides will be sent out. So I already did send them out to everybody that was on the initial lists, but certainly anybody that joined without, with, that wasn't on the initial list, I'll be sending them out again to everybody in this roster. And actually, that's actually a very good point I wanted to bring up before I get to this last piece. Now, I've, I've mentioned in the last couple webinars, but occasionally I'll send these out uh, with the attachments. I try to cut down on the number of links, but I still get a lot of like spam bounce backs. So uh, part of it, I mean, I try to limit the number of uh, recipients uh, that, that it goes out to. I send multiple copies of the email out to small groups of recipients to try to avoid that spam uh, filtering, but I still get quite a few of them. So if there's any way for you on your side to get with your IT area and for example, whitelist the WPSIC uh, domain, the email address, that would make it easier for future communication. Uh, again, it's up to you if, if there's a way for you to easily do that. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to try to find a better way to to find out exactly which ones were bounced back and just find a different way of getting it to you. But the point is, I definitely will be sending these out again. And, and on that note, if you're on today and you signed in with your email address, and if you don't get this email within, let's let's say, a few days, again, next week at the latest, you might want to shoot me an email individually because that'll tell me that uh, I might need to put you in a separate list that I just send individual emails to. I might need to 
there's a there's a way to build a macro to do that uh, to hopefully avoid the spam filtering. But I'd like everybody to get the information, and I'm trying to find different ways of doing that. So again, anything we can do there, hopefully that'll help. And yeah, definitely anybody that attends every session or any session, I should say, I add you to the mailing list that I send out stuff in the future. Uh, and then of course, if you ever wanna be removed, just send me an email and I can clean it out. But as you attend a session, you get added to the email list. So Stephanie, you'll be definitely in there now. And now onto our final session, just a quick listing of some of our resources we have. Again, this links you to the WPS overall audit website which has all of our topics. We have the WPS YouTube audit playlist. There are other areas of WPS like claims, provider enrollment that, that have their own YouTube section. This is just the audit playlist. And then the next few slides are just lists of the YouTube videos we have. I'm not gonna go through every single one by any means, but I'll just point out a few things. Again, that bad debt, uh, I, I referenced this earlier. We've got an RHC one. Oh, oh, all of our documentation and templates. Uh, this is the older version prior to 10.122. We have individual videos for each of the templates, 10.122 and after. And you'll see that just later on. Every webinar we have gets recorded and put out here. Uh, there are a lot of S10 webinars. Uh, I talked about bad debt. I think that's just a that's a duplicate let's see some other ones uh in some cases we have things that are just like general education for example cost assignment and allocation we put that one out there and i'm going to have a series of those types of training videos out there but that just shows you how to basically how to fill out worksheet a versus b-1 what we're looking for when we're reviewing it so some of the things to be concerned with, requesting new cost centers, requesting new stat changes. Uh, let's see, home office, SCH, I referenced that one earlier. Uh, this one I do want to mention, this acute and cost swing bed sniff, sniff rates. This is a video about them, but for anybody that uses our website to get those rates, I recently updated with a lot of states that we were waiting on. We've got a lot of that data. so. There's a lot of additional information that wasn't there prior to about two weeks ago. So if you need those, feel free to check that out. And here are all the templates that I talked about. We have an individual YouTube video for the 10, 1, 22 and after. And that kind of takes us to where we are right now. Now I, I put in a date yesterday and I did not get to this, but this organ acquisition cost report flow, that's the first organ acquisition video I'm gonna put out there. I was hoping to get to that all day yesterday and I just ran out of time in the morning and then didn't have any time in the afternoon. But this, both of these will be out at the latest by the end of this week. A organ acquisition cost report flow and then the RHC background and consolidation of the rates. Uh, those are both be out there by the end of this week. And again, you can see that by just going to the YouTube playlist. And they'll also be updated and embedded in their related uh, website articles when they exist. The ones that are planned for the future, first of all, last time I mentioned that I was gonna be doing a series of organ acquisition videos. The one I just referenced is the first, but I think there'll be at least three, uh, maybe even a few more over the next year or so. Uh, the time study one I mentioned, that'll be probably the very next one. Uh, a discussion of the various types of costs and uh, what qualifies for the reimbursement, that'll be one of them. So, name for it. It's not really a checklist, it's just a document that provides guidance. I introduced it, it's on the website, and we, I said I was going to make some changes to it to incorporate a few things that have come up. And in some cases, some pieces of it will indeed be more like a checklist. So I'm going to revamp that 
update the website with the new version. And at that point, I'm going to be putting the YouTube video together for that. So that's what we're doing here. And as far as our webinars, just shows the list of them, including today's. And that takes us to just a few minutes before the hour. So I'll open it back up to see if there are any questions on anything we've talked about. Oh, yeah, definitely. So if you sign, as long as you put in your name and email address, and even more importantly, the email address. Of knowing, you know, who to send it to. You can call in for audio, obviously, but I certainly recommend you signing in with the email address, uh, even if it is a guest. Okay, well, with that, if there are no questions, I just wanted to thank everybody for your time today. I uh, hope you have a great lunch and afternoon, and let me know if you have any questions in the meantime, but I will be sending this email out, again, no later than the end of next week, and it'll have all this information, and I look forward to seeing you in the next webinar. Have a good one.